Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Who Killed Teresa, and I'm your host, John Allure. And I'm very pleased um, the author and criminologist Michael Arntfield will be joining us shortly. Michael is the author of Murder City, the untold story of Canada's serial killer capital about London, Ontario. And it's a book we've been discussing um, at length. Um, Michael is a former beat cop and detective who became a criminologist and currently teaches criminology at Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, he has been a regular commentator on uh, crime in the Canadian media, including uh, an, an, an expert panelist on CBC's long-running investigative documentary series, The Fifth Estate. And he helped create and hosts the true crime reality series To Catch a Killer, which airs on the A&E network. Uh, Michael's current book is Murder in Plain English, looking at murder through the words of killers. Uh, I didn't expect to have uh, two interviews running back to back here, Kim Rosmo and then uh, uh, Michael, but the opportunity presented itself and I just couldn't pass it by. So We'll get back to the Quebec um, cases very shortly, but before we do, uh, one more uh, interview with uh, Michael, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome him to the podcast. Michael Arnfield, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, John. Thanks uh, for having me. Absolutely. And... Um, you know, first of all, I, I, I realize I'm late to the game on Murder City. Certainly, this uh, by about two years, this this <laughs> it's not it's not your latest project. And part of that is, um, I think it was the the um, uh, investigative reporter Rob Tripp who said, "John, you've got to read this book." And I, I kept putting it off. And and part that, in part, I just had my head so much in the hole of. Quebec crimes that I didn't even bother to notice that something very similar was happening in London, Ontario at almost the same time. Yeah, it really is. And I've, I've mentioned this before when I do outreach talks and, and lectures on the book. I mentioned this, that really what happened in London and London's uh, census metropolitan area and for that matter, much of southwestern Ontario over that 24 year period is really sort of what I liken to the Rosetta Stone for understanding, translating, and contextualizing what else was going on uh, in terms of violent crime in Canada. We see in that city, in that area, over that period, really a number of firsts, investigative firsts, but also the emergence of offender types and associated paraphilias uh, and um, really sort of criminal signatures before they're even tabled in the clinical or forensic literature. And, and what it is is really sort of, um, unfortunately, a harbinger of much of what was to come in Canada up to including the present with respect to the current crisis involving murdered and missing Aboriginal women. Right. You you couldn't ask for, I mean, in some ways, a, a more comprehensive lexicon of crime and criminals and, and problems with police agencies. That's, you nailed it. That's exactly what it is. I mean, if there is... Uh, a playbook in terms of how to screw these things up, uh, you know, it's exhibited in the pages of that book, as I've captured quite accurately, involving uh, as a result of a number of really rare and, and, and priceless primary source uh, interviews and documents. So um, you were a, a beat cop, detective, turned criminologist. Where have I heard this narrative before? It's strikingly familiar to to Kim Rosmo. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about um, maybe for our, our listeners uh, as best you can? And this may be an impossible task. What happened in London, and and how did you become involved? Well, lots been happening in London for a long time. <laughs> the the book it covers specifically a quarter century period. Uh, from 1959 to 1984, and there's a reason why it starts in 1959. Uh, people, your listeners throughout Canada and perhaps beyond will know the case of Lynn Harper uh, and the associated wrongful conviction of Stephen Truscott. That really is 
sort of the case that kickstarts a very dark 25-year period in the city and region, whereby we see at least six, and more likely based on the peer review of my findings, uh, nine serial murderers operating contemporaneously or in immediate succession in a city with a mean population over this same period of only 170,000. So you can imagine you extrapolate uh, that uh, to, say, New York's current population, and you've got, you know, uh, I think the translation is 85 serial murderers walking the streets at the same time. So um, the the ratio is, is staggering, and we're talking about a police force, and police forces plural, some of which are now uh, defunct and extinct and really should have been before that period who were, you know, way out of their depth. And I got involved in part because, uh, first of all, I had an interest in it and had some colleagues who worked as part of Project Angel, which was a designated cold case initiative in the late 90s. And they cleared a few on DNA, but there were still a few that uh, sort of I learned about through my friends and colleagues that, again, I recognized even before finishing a PhD and committing my career to this, that were really unusual and really disturbing, and one of which I... Uh, remembered from actually being a boy and hearing about it and then sort of it being the boogeyman story of southwestern Ontario. Fast forward then to 2015 and the uh, son of uh, the protagonist in the book. So this isn't laid out for your re or listeners who haven't read it. This isn't laid out. There's a lot of takeaway points, a lot of learning points, but it's laid out as a narrative with a protagonist and he's a real life protagonist. His name was Dennis Alsup. He was a detective with the Ontario Provincial Police, and when he retired, as was the case at the time, you were allowed to keep your notes and keep your files and keep your diaries, and uh, essentially he willed those to his son upon his death, and his son knew of my cold case research study group, the Cold Case Society at Western University that I spearheaded when I was still a cop and just teaching there part-time before I got a, a tenured appointment, and he thought, you know what, there's stuff in here that is not in any database, that does not... Um, have an institutional memory among that is you know sort of that exists among current practitioners and current detectives this is stuff that would not be found anywhere else and that you know if it was subject to uh, modern day analysis and scrutiny what could we learn about what actually happened and the truth is you know that the 29 murders discussed in the book on top of other murders these are not uh, i should stress that during the same period these are 29 low facilitation victims, so victims who would not normally be at risk of predation. Uh, children, women in their own homes, uh, you know, people not involved, uh, for instance, or not reflected in the other crimes going on in the city, whether they're domestic murders or, or murders for hire or murders related to the drug subculture. These are sexual murders of strangers uh, by strangers, which are statistically speaking, extraordinarily rare. So the reality is uh, that upon receiving these materials and then sort of cross-referencing them to my own research and knowledge, uh, it was actually far worse than anyone thought. And the, those revelations and the associated hypothesis I've developed is in the book. Well, that's that's very interesting because uh, I, I get that a lot with sort of when I'm talking about specifically a cluster of crimes in 77, 78 in the Quebec region, and I'm only talking about 30 to 40, people go, ah, oh, you you know, you're front loading it all. And, and I turn around and say, wait a minute, I'm talking about 30 to 40 cases. There were 179 murders in, in Quebec in 1977 alone. I'm not talking about the domestic affairs, right. as you say, the people in the drug trade or the cr criminal element. It's a very, very specific subset. That's right. I, I wanted to touch on two other things you, you mentioned there. First of all, the, the Stephen Truscott, um, Lynn Harper case, which was foundational. Um, you'd refer to it as the Truscott hangover. Um, you, you suggest that because the police got it so so wrong in that case, and Stephen Truscott was wrongfully convicted, um, it took decades for him to to achieve his his innocence. That police became a little gun shy, a little overly cautious, a little overly reluctant to to maybe make linkages. Um, maybe comment on that, and and then I just wanted to say that I, I think the device of Dennis Alsop. 
um, this sort of beleaguered detective who's a stand-in hero in the book or, or narrator in, in a sense is, um, is, is very effective and, 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 and uh, uh, just kept me riveted. Well, thanks. Regarding the latter, yeah, I mean, my position is, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of a lot of true crime. I find a lot of it, and this is why for many years it had a bad rap. It was down market, it was tawdry, it was sleazy, it sort of was offender-centric, it was just sort of exposition, uh, pages of exposition of gory details instead of following a more literary format, which is sort of a third-person narrator with a a protagonist based on a real person and all of the information being corroborated. You know, the best stories tell themselves. You don't need to embellish them. You don't need to sort of jazz them up again with these salacious, uh, you know, additional details or, or, or sort of, you know, your dark and stormy night blood curdling, you know, pick your cliché. So, I mean, what I'm trying to do with this book is the first in a series, the follow-up Mad City, about uh, a series of campus murders in Wisconsin will be out in November and available in multiple formats, including as an audio book. But what I'm really trying to do here is create a didactic, ver- or a didactic version of true crime, whereby you get the story uh, and follows the conventions of the genre, but at the same time, it's a little bit more upmarket, it's a little bit smarter, and you will you know, come away from it having learned something. I've gotten emails and calls from you know, retired investigators all over the world who say, you know, I spent 30 years as a you know, sex crimes or homicide investigator, and I hadn't heard of half these things. And I would have approached cases much differently had I known that. And I mean, some of these people are only recently retired. And a lot of this stuff, sadly, aside from the agencies that invite me in and a handful of other experts in, including your last guest, Kim Rossmo, a lot of these agencies just don't know that these techniques and bodies of knowledge exist. And so oh, I'm really trying to close ranks here between your, your, your true crime readers who you know, enjoy true crime as a genre, your general interest people who maybe don't like true crime but will appreciate good storytelling and good narr- narrative devices, and then also law enforcement. So, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do here. Right. And, but having said that, I, I will say um, I've, at, there are points, and, and not, not because in any way uh, from your literary invention, it's just the facts, but there are points where I felt like I was reading a Thomas Harris novel. I mean, I mean, really, be, I mean, we have we have serial killers and severed heads and severed arms, um, collections of human excrement. Um, and then these 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 names that are historic. This is what the investigators were using at the time. The tissue slayings, um, the bedroom sl- strangler, the mad slasher, the porn man, the chambermaid slayer. I, I'm sitting there and I'm, and I, you know, at the one time I'm, I'm, I'm saying, what, all of this in, in little sleepy London, Ontario? But I guess in a way that's your point, right? Yes, yeah. all of this in London, Ontario. Yeah, it really is a cautionary tale for that, for that reason. Um, that, yeah, it's, and what's perhaps most frustrating is beyond the notes that I received, how little media, historical, and institutional attention these cases received. I mean, people who had lived in London their whole lives and heard the title of the book and, and sort of some of the facts or the hypothesis and bristled and said, there's absolutely no way, and they read it, and they're jarred, and they had no idea that this was literally going on in their backyard. And the flip side of that is I probably get a dozen emails a week through my website at uh, michaelarnfield.com from people who grew up in London and have very traumatizing memories of people, you know, pulling over beside them, trying to get them in a car, trying to lure them in a car, all of the same sort of methods and modus operandi that are reflected in the book. And they sort of were doubted at the time. They tried to report it. The police rebuffed them. Their parents rebuffed them. Their teachers rebuffed them. They started to question, you know, are these fabricated uh, memories? Did this actually happen? And they read the book and they, they were validated. They realized, you know what, it was a dangerous place at the time and no one was listening. Can I ask you, you begin um, a chapter with the Shakespeare quote um, from the, I was going to say the Scottish play, but we're neither, I don't think either of us are in a theater right now, so I can just say Macbeth. You can say it, yeah. <laughs> Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Can, can you begin to unpack that a bit and first explain, can you explain the case management model 
in police investigation at that time and how that could have been problematic? So to quote a colleague of mine at the Murder Accountability Project, which is another initiative in uh, Metro DC I'm involved in, I'll talk more about that later on, but that's something your listeners can actively participate in and search for active serial murderers right now in the United States. To quote him, Policing was, and unfortunately remains in many cases, especially if you're talking about the OPP, who quite frankly have learned nothing from this period and are as bad or worse as they are depicted in the book. Policing and major case investigations were paper-based, scattered, and siloed. And what would happen is, uh, I mean, it was in part during this same period a, a functional limitation of technology at the time, but it was also a reflection sort of of the very uh, sort of jealously guarded, factionalistic way that investigations were approached between police agencies, whereby everything existed in hard copy in a manila folder, and one person had that, and you daren't ask to look at it, you daren't, if you were that investigator, share it. Uh, you know, these cases were property, these lives were commodities to be exchanged and redeemed for uh, whether it was accolades internally or promotion or some other tangible reward. It wasn't necessarily that there was a common good that drove it. And the exception, of course, is uh, Dennis Alsop, the protagonist, and to some extent, you know, his boss, James McBride, who, you know, he was your classic sort of uh, grizzled and jaded, you know, smoke him if you got him, hang him high, seen it all cop, and, you know, recognized that confusion that I talk about to quote from Shakespeare. He recognized that essentially the city and area were under siege and that uh, there needed to be a paradigm shift, that things needed to change. And he allowed Dennis to explore very unconventional methods, which, as I discussed in the one chapter involved, and I've got a meeting about this actually with um, the diocese this week, which involved at the time, and this was unheard of, going to uh, a theology professor at Western University yes. and consulting him as to whether there was some, and consider the, the, the period, right? It was the period of Rosemary's baby right. and sort of the, the, the religious scares of the late 60s, but consulting a theologian and asking, you know, could there be a cult operating in this city? Are these posings, I mean, we see posing of victims in London far earlier than in other noteworthy cases from the U.S., and they didn't know how to interpret them, and that's part of the confusion. But the thought was at the time that maybe this had some iconographic, satanic significance. And so we see this third-party expert so who's an expert in uh, occultism and demonology. I mean, again, you think you're reading a Tom Harris novel in this reality, <laughs> you know, being brought into the investigation to consult as to whether what was being done to these women and these children was, in fact, part of some larger sect or whether it was just, you know, one or two madmen. In reality, it was about nine madmen. Right. And then you, with nine madmen, you also mentioned, I think, the point that is very well taken that um, the, the jurisdiction where the body is dumped, that's who owns the case. And in many, in many occasions, never mind that the victim and the victimology from where they were from is a different jurisdiction, just as those case files weren't shared, information from, say, within London, Ontario to uh, a, a jurisdiction on the outskirts of town, they wouldn't they wouldn't meet together in, in, in a, in a multi-jurisdictional fashion to, to try to resolve these issues, correct? That's right. So uh, this is, again, where this territoriality, this factionalism is, is rooted, and it changes from one of two extremes depending on the management culture of a particular police agency. And as you see in the book, it, it shifts dramatically as we move into the 80s. And one of the later victims, Donna Jean Alcock, murdered in 1983, is sort of like that movie Bon Cop, Bad Cop, literally strat <laughs> straddling yes, yes. jurisdictions, and they bicker for hours over who's going to take it because neither wants it. Well, rewind 15 years earlier before sort of this torrent of violence, and they were the OPP in particular were quite eager to take them. In fact, they would demand that they had them. It, it's in our jurisdiction, it's ours. And then, of course, 29 or at that point, 28 victims later, they no longer want them when they're in their jurisdiction. But this was common in that wherever the body turned up, uh, you know, full, the, the kitchen sink, everything w went to the agency 
uh, who had that jurisdiction, regardless of where the crime occurred, regardless if there was, for geographic profiling purposes, other data points or other addresses of significance where evidence was located in another jurisdiction. And there was really no way to share that information. This, I mean, you, you've, this has been talked about among criminologists and, and, and sort of depicted in film and television endlessly as sort of being an invention of, you know, sickos like Ted Bundy or the Zodiac Killer who, and David Fincher's film Zodiac explores this quite, uh, I think, authentically, whereby, you know, there would be crimes committed in multiple jurisdictions. And there's a scene in Fincher's Zodiac where, you know, they finally figure out, the SFPD and Vallejo PD figure out that they're investigating the same guy. And they ask, you know, can you telefax us, you know, your report? Well, we don't have a telefax. Well, can you, uh, can we get a hard copy? Well, we can't provide a hard copy. They're restricted. And so even when they finally get on the same page, there is um, this inability to actually execute uh, the transference of files. More often, those conversations just simply didn't take place. And again, in, in London, it was Dennis Alsop who had colleagues in London and sort of off the books was, was sort of asking to look at their files and was sort of circumventing, again, this, this very fortified system of uh, you know, it's our capital O case, and, and don't bother us. And, you know, since then, inquiries like the Bernardo, like the Camel Commission inquiry into Paul Bernardo in particular, really sort of rebuked this yeah. this culture and, and said, you know what, there needs to be a common file sharing system. There needs to be a standardized major case management model. You know, why is it that the Toronto police didn't realize that the serial rapist that they were investigating was also the serial murderer, the school group killer in the Niagara region. And these two places never compared notes. Well, sadly, like most inquests and inquiry recommendations, you know, they were made in good faith and they said they'd follow them. But the, the song remains the same across a lot of Canada today and that people simply, the agencies simply just don't share their information. I, I want to circle back to the bon cop, bad cop um... Uh, reference uh, uh, because it, it, that is exactly what came to my mind when I read that portion of the book. And for listeners who who don't know that movie, it's a it's a, a Canadian movie. And what um, Michael is talking about is is the victim is found right on the border of Quebec and Ontario at the beginning of the movie. And there is a squabble between the OPP and the Sorte de Quebec. And if I can find it, I'll, I'll post it on the website. Do you think that uh, Michael? that um, offenders deliberately exploit um, what they know is a, a breakdown in communication between jurisdictions? Right. So to follow up on, I think, where I was going with that last uh, sort of digression was um, these types of countermeasures, exploiting loopholes in uh, communications, in file sharing, was thought by many people to sort of have originated with, you know, these high-functioning psychopaths like Bundy and the Zodiac, when in reality, as I explain in the book, it was occurring, again, this is another outlier, another sort of uh, decoder ring for crimes yet to come okay. in, in this continent originated in, as best we can tell, in the London area, where in fact, yeah, that's exactly what they were doing. Okay. Um, do you see eras in serial killing? I, I always find people, you know... <laughs> try to link too much sometimes, bring things on for 50 or 60 years. But do you see, do you see that things sort of transition? Uh, you have the 60s and 70s, and then you have the late 80s, you move into the crack cocaine era. Do you see it that way, or am I, am I wrong on that? All right, so here is a good time for me to introduce the Murder Accountability Project. So uh, there are eras, there are phyla, there are generations that we can actually track visually now. Uh, this is not yet available in Canada, and there's that's a whole other, I think, episode. But there's some reasons why there are some intentional impediments laid down by StatsCan and police organizations in this country to prevent this. But in the U.S., and I'm the only Canadian who's a, a member of the board here, at murderdata.org, you and your listeners can go and you can track by year in every city and region in the United States. You can track by victim, you can track by cause of death, you can track by circumstance, you can track by apparent motive, and you can track by solved versus unsolved. And when you enter obvious serial murder um, indicators into the search algorithm that we've built into the site, you can see 
generationally. So for instance, if you were to pick female and strangled and then a particular city, you can watch as generationally the number of unsolved stranglings of women. So we know that over 90% of serial murders, so serial murder is inherently sexual, and we know that over 90% of documented cases involve some version of strangling, whether as the cause of death or whether to incapacitate a victim. So when you input female and strangled and you see they're unsolved, we're talking likely about a stranger on stranger attack. And this is likely an indication of a serial offender. And you can search by city, you can throw in Miami, you can throw in Milwaukee, you can throw in New York, you can throw in, you know, Pocatello, Idaho. And you can see that every few years there are these spikes of red and red indicates unsolved cases such that I mean, you're talking, uh, my group at Western now is looking into 44 stranglings in Atlanta over a period of only six years, all unsolved. And when you pull up the unsolved, you can see mostly females in their late teens, early 20s, mostly African-American and uh, essentially prime sex trade worker age. And that this person has, or these people have never been caught. And you can actually look at it in terms of uh, spikes, yes, like you said, but these go back to 1976, which is when the current uniform crime reporting standards were implemented, and that's how we we, in, we sort of program our algorithm. But you can see at uh, 80s, 90s, like, so 90s are equ equated with crack in many cases, but you'll see in a number of cities spikes in apparent serial activity in the 90s as well, and then essentially a gradual dropping off of uh, that towards the early 2000s. In some cities, and then in some cities, it goes up. What's most concerning is we see that, uh, and I talk about this in Murder City, DNA, we have DNA now. We didn't have DNA back in the 60s and the 70s in the period discussed in the book. We have sex offender registries now, which are really the best indicator of how to prioritize suspects when a sexual murder occurs in a given jurisdiction. We have you know, ballistics databases. We have all of these tools now, and yet, the overall clearance rate in the United States has been, consider has been consistently declining since the late 1960s. So while violent crime is going down, you would think that we're solving more murders, when in reality, the solved rate has been going down faster than violent crime has been declining, in spite of all these new technologies like DNA and, again, sex offender registries. So the question is why? Why, with more tactical and technical advantages today are police solving fewer crimes. And you'll see the national solved rate for murder in the U.S. hovers a little over 66%. So that's, you know, 35% of murders going unsolved nationally. Some cities are really bad, and I won't advertise where they are. Um, well, I think we know, we know one. <laughs> yeah. Well, some are hovering around 20%. Yeah. So, yeah. Eight, you know, we're talking 8 in 10 murders. If you're there tomorrow and murder, there's an 8 in 10 chance that your murder will never be solved. And it's terrifying. Well, that's that's interesting. We touched on this a little bit um, when I was talking to Kim Rosmo. You, and you go into it in your book, the, the sort of failure in some sense of Vi-class. And um, it's not, it's, uh, CODIS is, is the American version, but I think Canada, it's the National DNA Data Bank. Um, but nevertheless, as you say, uh, uh, CODIS, uh, CODIS is a version of it. Get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it's paid for in Canada by the FBI so that they can have the Canadian and other nationalities um, or other nations uh, data for unsolved crimes and, and or the DNA of offenders. Um, and as you say, I mean, it, it's troubling that the rate isn't going down. Kim sort of said, well, uh, a, a lot of times it's the police agencies don't have the resources. A lot of times these are incredibly complex crimes. Yes, I accept all that. But you say there's there may be some problems with a garbage in, garbage out um, situation with the, the actual input of data in these systems, correct? Right. So just to clarify, the National DNA Data Bank is uh, the essentially the initiative. It's, it is the um, area of the RCMP that employs people that do this. CODIS is the program that is used. So yes, in Canada, we do use CODIS. And then yes, you're right, it is uh, sort of um, subsidized by the FBI because we don't have our own. And um, that is different from then what you mentioned, VICLAS, the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System. In the US, that is known as VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. So. The Murder Accountability Project was created in part due to the failure of VICAP in the U.S., which uh, is essentially 
a way to link crimes over multiple jurisdictions based on things like common modus operandi, signature, victimology, and what have you. The difference between Canada and the U.S. in this area is that by class, in theory, submissions, so it's a, it's a questionnaire that lead investigators and homicides are supposed to submit for upload to this massive database, is mandatory. And in the U.S., VICAP is voluntary. So we realize at Murder Accountability that VICAP was a well-intentioned idea, but an experiment that had failed and failed miserably. So we created our own, and we manually logged in over 800,000 murders going back to 1965 for search. And uh, that is the most comprehensive homicide data bank in the world, uh, far more than VICAP. So this is a public VICAP, a crowdsourced VICAP we have created in Canada. You'll never see anything like this really achieve liftoff. VICLASS is uh, mandatory, but is very much garbage in, garbage out. The questionnaire is, again, very well designed. And, again, ask questions about body posing souvenir collection, trophy collection, mutilations, uh, movement of the body, transportation and concealment, apparent motive, uh, all the things that would help us pinpoint you know, key behavioral discriminators that if it showed up in more than one city, we know we're dealing with a mobile serial offender. Well, as I mentioned at the outset of your show here, investigators aren't trained in any of this stuff. They don't know that there's four recognized disposal pathways. They don't know, a disposal pathway meaning how you, what you do with the body after death. And they don't know what those mean and how they reflect offender organization. They don't know the difference between modus operandi and signature if they know those terms at all. They certainly don't know terms like victimology and suspectology. They don't know the difference between a trophy and a souvenir. They don't know what paraphilias are. They don't know the difference between primary and secondary paraphilias. All of the things that you need to recognize to effectively track an offender's movements. So what we have is, again, a system that these submissions are mandatory, but you might as well just put that questionnaire on a dartboard and throw darts at it, and you know, you'd know you have about the same success rate. And I don't know of anyone who has worked for the SMP by class unit or been affiliated with Viclass on secondment or as an investigative consultant who can cite a single uh, success story as a result of this system, which costs billions annually to maintain. So in the US, it was voluntary and it failed. At Murder Accountability Project, we created our own. In Canada, it's mandatory. The questionnaire is locked down. It's never been released. Uh, they will not comply with freedom of information requests for the information or access to information requests for the information. And they will not share the supplementary homicide information contained in that database to any outside agency to allow us to build a murder accountability project in Canada. So um, there are, and this is really what I try to stress in the book, people, and you mentioned this in your show, people sort of sleep soundly at night thinking that there are chivalrous, tireless, you know, investigators like the ones they see on TV, true detectives who are, you know, going about solving these cases and leveraging all these technologies to find these people. And in reality, uh, that's not happening. And it's a frightening prospect that people, at least in Canada in particular, don't want to think about. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of other things. Before I do, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, the work of the, the Murder Accountability Project. As you know, I've only, I only became aware of it in the last month since the article in the Bloomberg News that I've talked about before that uh, serial killers should fear this algorithm. The, the, the data sets and, and the information out there is astonishing and everyone should go and have a, have a look at it. Um, I want to touch on, you, you opened with some, some talk about Project Angel, which was a task force in the mid-90s to, to look into these London crimes. Can you touch a little bit on what is potentially problematic sometimes with these task forces? And you've already kind of addressed, well, sometimes they get holds, a hold of this technology and they don't know how to use it. But you, you talked about um, the OPP using, using task force sometimes to clean house of, of OPP malcontents. And does that happen? Yeah, you know, and it's not just the OPP, which, you know, has, uh, I would say, a disproportionate share of dangerously inept malcontents, but it is symptomatic of policing generally. I mean, if you've ever seen uh, David Simon's, you know, ethics the, series, The Wire. Well, I was going to say, you, you talk yeah. about uh, an officer suspended for discharging a service pi pistol. That's Prisbalitsky from The Wire. I, 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 I was astounded. 
it, it's it's funny how art imitates life uh, more frequently than life imitates art. But and and again, the fact that that shows up in season one of The Wire is really, I think, representative of the fact that this is systemic throughout law enforcement, and that these task force forces are created. And unfortunately, the person heading them is usually handpicked and usually pretty good. But you'll often see, and again, to draw on TV and film as sort of, you know, a good uh, touchstone for your listeners, you, you'll always hear sort of this this gung ho detective say, you know, I get to pick my own people, because and that is really a corollary of the reality that task forces, you know, are given sort of a superstar head person who's sort of the face of them. But they really yeah, become clearing houses for people who they don't know what to do with. And I've worked on countless task forces as a cop, and some that I've created, and some where I got to pick my own people, and some that I got shunted into for whatever reason. And maybe it's because, you know, at that for that particular case, I had a transferable skill that was, you know, helped round out the team. And then in other cases, I know it was simply because they needed a warm body, and uh, the unit I was on at the time could spare me. Well, more frequently, the motives for putting people on these task forces are nefarious, as we see in The Wire, whereby you know, no one wants to work with them, or they can be hidden there and do less damage than if they're out on the street you know, interacting with the public. You, know, you can put them behind a desk reviewing surveillance footage, or you can have them you know, pick up DNA submissions from the Center for Forensic Science and just drive back and forth to Toronto every day and not really have to do any investigative work. And... Um, Unfortunately, I mean, this is the reality of any job that requires people in that uh, how to manage your human resources is the first challenge. And then the second challenge is uh, actually solving the cases. Well, we see often the cases don't get solved because the first problem never gets addressed. I want to touch on two final points about Murder City and then we can move on to other things. Um, you bring up something very chilling from the book, and that is the the the. the possible relationship between two offenders, Robert Bridgewater and, and an unknown offender that became known as the neighbor, um, and the idea that we move possibly with these two offenders from copycatting each other's to, to something you refer to as instruction and mentorship. Can you, can you touch on that a little bit? Because that, I, uh, that, was astonishing to me when I read that in the book. Well, it really is chilling. And uh, when I saw it again and, and researched this, I was uh, astounded, first of all, that no one had made the multi-generational linkage, and, and two, that it was never explored. Uh, and, I mean, there's a whole backstory to all this. I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the sort of short version is uh, for your listeners, uh, there's a series of murders in London in 1968 that have a very, very specific victimology and an even more specific criminal signature. So something the offender does that has some fantasy purpose or s serves some visual fixation that sort of sustains them until they need to act out again. And uh, this information was never released to the public. As, and it should never be. And this is a, probably the, the key piece of holdback information that the police should hang on to. And uh, Dennis Alsop knew who did it. He knew who committed these murders in London and essentially was kiboshed from acting on him, even though even by today's standards, there was more than a, there was a preponderance of circumstantial evidence that would have at least allowed for his arrest. Maybe he would have been convicted, maybe not. We cannot say but essentially he uh, was uh, neutered, if you will, by the higher-ups um, from doing anything substantial. So this guy left town. I'm satisfied he murdered three other children in Toronto. And then 1989, 21 years later, a completely different boy near London turns up dead under identical circumstances, similar in age, but more specifically, the signature and cause of death is identical. And we see someone else promptly arrested and actually some very good detective work by a recently deceased uh, OPP detective um, who results in an arrest there. And it's somebody different than the neighbor. And I did some research, and this took considerable work, and I figured out, you know, what did these two have in common? Because we know the neighbor often will hear about offenders 
the toolbox killers, the most chilling example in California in the 80s being the best case scenario, our best case example, who trade notes in prison and concoct these schemes and share their ideas and they end up sort of collaborating once they both get out. But we know the neighbor was never actually in prison. We know he was in some mental institutions, but at the same time, Bridgewater was not in men mental institutions. So how did they compare notes? How did they hatch this scheme, this common signature, and what did it mean? And I figured out that they both grew up on the same street in the same town about two hours from London. And I actually booked uh, an appointment to go and see Bridgewater uh, in prison, where he still is for that 1989 murder. He's in his 80s now, and ask him before he dies what, where he learned this, how he was instructed in this method by the neighbor who had done it 21 years earlier, and more specifically, what it meant. And it's so visually specific that it seems to, uh, and paraphilias often have a very specific origin in childhood about and sort of how they uh, how they sort of get imprinted upon the mind uh, I wanted to know what it meant and what it meant to both of them they would both do it to innocent children and uh, he filed basically a complaint with the prison administration that uh, he was afraid to meet with me and what I might do and that I was harassing him and I got a very pointed letter from Corrections Canada basically saying I'm not I'm not to go there. I'm not allowed on the property. So he still refused uh, visits. He still me. refused yeah. visits. Yeah. And uh, in fact, prison officials are running interference on this because ultimately, uh, you know, these six dead children's families uh, come second to his, you know, mm -hmm. being able to watch TV and not be interrupted by my visits at the medium security club fed prison that he's at. Um, so uh, uh, I, some some of my some of the listeners of this podcast are Canadian, but to my great surprise, a lot are from all over the world. So I have to ask you: Can you tell our listeners what life in prison typically means for a Canadian offender? Oh boy! Well, <laughs> Better from you than me. <laughs> yeah, not life. That's for sure. Uh, unless you are the small handful of people who are appointed as dangerous offenders. And again, the first dangerous offender designation in Canada came from a killer from London, which is discussed uh, in towards the end of the book where I look at the murders after, uh, you know, 1984 and, and where London went after this record setting 25 years. Um, but that's again, maybe for another episode, unless you're a dangerous offender, someone like a Paul Bernardo, uh, you and which means that you were imprisoned indefinitely, and that typically requires that you have been convicted for three crimes of extraordinary uh, turpitude and violence that can show again a preponderance of evidence that you are incorrigible. But if you were just you know to be sentenced to life for you know a murder or even several murders, uh, you can expect that you know you will be uh before a parole board and a very generous sympathetic offender centric parole board uh you know probably after seven years in many cases and if for whatever reason uh your mental health is drawn into question most recently with um vince lee the greyhound bus mutilator who's mentioned in the book yes and now, you know goes by a new name uh you will be not only released into the public, but have the record of your crime expunged. And that, and that is a particularly horrific crime. I mean, they all are, but the Vince Lee one is shocking. Well, and, and now an absolute discharge, meaning that it never happened. His prints have been destroyed. The record of his arrest has been destroyed. Uh, he has a new name. He could, in theory, go and apply uh, to work at a daycare uh, next week mm. and pass a background check because right. there is no record of it. Now, mind you, for a deep screening like that, for a vulnerable position check, no, they, they would see, there would still be a local RCMP record of the incident, but say for a job that just required a, a criminal background check, so, uh, you know, working not with children or, or, or vulnerable people, but in a position of extraordinary trust and authority uh, for the government, for instance, that he would pass that. So... Um... You, uh, you're at Western, uh, Western University in London, Ontario, um, where you, you teach a course in, um, uh, I guess, in criminology and literature. Uh, right. Can you tell us about that? Because the book has great um, references and, and divergence into the literature, Edgar Allan Poe, Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, Shakespeare. Uh, that sounds fascinating. 
Yeah, that really is the cornerstone, actually, of my research. I, I approach criminology in an unusually interdisciplinary way. A lot of criminologists say, well, inter, you know, criminology is by its nature interdisciplinary and draws on all these fields, and they say that, but it really doesn't. I mean, the your garden variety criminology courses are still making hay out of, you know, theories from the 60s, you know, it sucks to be poor, and poor people commit crime, <laughs> therefore, you know, we should attack, you know, poverty is at the root of everything, or... Yeah. You know, let's look at these statistics from, you know, Great Britain in the 70s about inner city crime and what does that mean? Well, the reality is, and I've got two other books that discuss this in detail besides my, my true crime series, uh, the city books, as I call them, uh, Murder in Plain English, which will be out uh, this Tuesday, the 7th of March, uh, and Gothic Forensics, Criminal Investigative Procedure in Victorian Horror and Mystery, which is published um by a big New York academic publisher in the summer, are really the two proofs of concept that literary criminology, as I call it, so approaching the study of crime through stories, through how do offenders see their life stories? How do they learn from, again, orally or in writing, other crimes, uh, reported crimes, from conversations and oral histories provided by other offenders? How do uh, written documents, beyond just things like, for instance, handwriting analysis, uh, how do they provide us sort of investigative starting points um, for uh, analysis? But beyond that, how do we perhaps disruptively innovate? Things like the Murder Accountability Project and disruptive innovation. How can disruptive innovation in terms of finding criminals, solving crimes, helping victims, how can we learn from literature? And as I discuss in Gothic Forensics, most, if not all, of the current adequacy standards in law enforcement regarding homicide investigations were first conceived in a fictional context during the 19th century by writers like Poe and Doyle and others. Um, I look forward to reading all three of those, Michael. They sound really, really interesting. That um, Certainly uh, Mad City and Murder in Plain English I was aware of. I, I was not aware of Gothic Forensics. That, that sounds like a, a really great, uh, great read. Um, you um, last year you were a Fulbright chair at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Um, yep. Anything interesting come out of that? What were you working on? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I was there for the same thing. They called it law and literature. So the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities there, which is this very elite think tank sort of uh, research slash uh, lecture symposium center. Uh, that draws from a number of faculties, has a law and literature weekly seminar that uh, I hosted, uh, which was precisely that, uh, studying the evolution of the law and discussing, critically analyzing the evolution of the law and investigative methodologies as seen through the lens of literature. And, uh, you know, very innovative. And then going the other way, how can we use, again, writing to predictively model and profile offenders? Is how it's, it, that was very rewarding. At the same time, I, I rode as an observer and a consultant with the Metro Nashville Police Department, and that's where actually I met a cold case detective who is the focus of and the protagonist in the third city book in this series, Monster City, which is about uh, Nashville. And, I mean, you want to talk about a guy who, uh, next to Dennis Alsop, is really sort of the um, exemplar and the luminary in terms of how to solve these crimes is Detective Sergeant Pat Postiglione. I mean, <laughs> that's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is. He's what I call the New York Yankee in Dixie. You know, born and raised in Queens, moved, installed the HVAC system at the World Trade Center and then moved to, uh, to Nashville where he went on vacation and then stayed. And over the last five years of his career, cleared 55 cold cases and some of the most disturbing, oldest cases but just by using, you know, just his gumption and, and, and good innovative methodologies because he was not constrained by the bureaucracy. And in writing along with them and in meeting him and spending now hundreds of hours interviewing him and going over his files, I can tell you there's a certain, a certain perception and maybe stereotype people associate with the Deep South uh, or Southern policing, but I can tell you that that agency and then by extension the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation are, I mean, uh, I would say... Uh, remarkably ahead of most Canadian organizations. And um, I don't want to forget, uh, you, you're, you're no stranger to film and, and possibly television. Um, what can we uh, look forward to on the horizon? People certainly know you from To Catch a Killer. Um, what Any other projects we should know about? I have... Uh... 
a project in development now that uh, is inspired by Murder City. Uh, it is not necessarily based on the book, but it is, uh, I mean, you brought up a small handful of things distilled from the book. Let's just say that the content in the book and sort of the sum of my work uh, is in a sort of in a series that is in development with a major Canadian network right now uh, and which will likely air internationally. This is a scripted or a fictional series where I'm serving as a co-writer, consultant, and producer. So, uh, again, there is legs beyond this story um, that, you know, for people who maybe haven't read the book or won't get to the book, they will find some iteration of it uh, on television sometime soon. Okay. And then I, I kind of wanted to round back to kind of to to where your experience and my experience kind of intersect. Um, you certainly talk about these these crimes with very specific victimologies and modus operandi. Uh, I am talking about something similar in 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 uh, in Quebec. This came up when I interviewed uh, Kim. I, I kind of asked him, "How do you feel about the probability in in these cases in?" Connecting Montreal to Sherbrooke, he 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 sort of mentioned that he thought that you know a hundred stretch of miles uh, over a five year period was a bit of a stretch. He said he'd, he'd feel more comfortable with maybe you know six sixty uh, sixty days, and uh, I think he said a couple of um, uh, sixty days and 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 two miles. I wanted to get your opinion on this because I'm I'm not kind of I kind of let him off the hook there, but I'm not completely sold on that. I I, I feel certainly when you're in the ninth inning of these things, where cases are thirty or, and, and forty years old, what do you got to lose but to do a hail mary pass and and try to see some linkage, some commonality? What's your feeling on that? I mean, I feel the, you know the corridor between, between uh, Montreal and Sherbrooke is hundred miles. The corridor between London and Toronto is slightly more than 100 miles. You certainly have evidence of offenders shuffling back and forth if they had justification. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I should, uh, first of all, stress, Kim literally wrote the book on this. Oh, so, I, I, this I, I know it, absolutely. This, this is his shtick, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say, and I'm a huge fan of his work and, and have uh, sort of synthesized and applied his formula to cases. Uh, I will say what he's saying is perhaps the best case scenario. I mean, if the tighter the, the data points and the closer together the data points, both in space and in time, I would think the more accurate relying on the formula your profile is going to be in terms of identifying that key, that hot zone. Uh, but... Uh, I mean, Kim himself, and this is also it has been published widely, has identified four sort of psychogeographic uh, subtypes of serial offender. Uh, and so how offenders navigate space, and one of those four categories is what's known as the commuter killer. So someone who travels long distances, but there will inevitably be patterns left in those commutes, whether it's 100 miles, 200 miles, or, you know, at, at least outside of sort of their home area. Uh, it's for that reason that the FBI's Highway Serial Killing Initiative, which is also discussed in Murder City, you know, has identified uh, their unsubs at this point, but they've got over 300 uh, identified serial profiles on their database involving 300 essentially long-haul trucker killers who are killing over a you know, period of 1,000 uh, miles in some cases, coast to coast. So... Uh, we know that some version of that formula can be applied over longer distances. There is a, another recent textbook out called uh, Homicide, a Forensic Psychology Casebook, and it's an anthology written by some leading figures globally in this area, and including me. And the chapter I wrote on uh, cold cases uh, specifically applies geographic profiling to a case uh, from Michigan in uh, the 1970s and a series of victims there. And it, it goes uh, a few cities away. It goes, you know, upwards of 70, 80 miles. And it, it corroborates, in fact, what I've since learned is uh, a key person of interest and in where he was living at the time. So it, it's not ideal. Is it a good tool to prioritize suspects? Is it a, a good way to sort of um, cast a net and see what you get, uh, you know, I've always said the, you're not going to catch anything unless you try. And the more lures you have in the water, the better your odds. So this is one of many tools that, while perhaps 
isn't ideal going over these long, long distances because, again, there's just too many variables to, to keep track of. Um, it is, I think, uh, one effective tool, I think, that merits trying. And, and certainly the success in the U.S., I mean, using this and other tools that the, that the FBI have to confidently now publicly state, you know, we have uh, commuter killers at least 300 of them that we've identified, and there's uh, subsets of victims to go along with each of those. I mean, I think it suggests that some version of this profile can be adapted for long, longer distances. All right, and uh, I forgot that you do bring that up in, in, in Murder City, the idea that the, the, the invention of the King's Highway uh, system gave rise to this commuter killer and, right. and, and that, that the system in Canada came before the system that's maybe more widely known, the Eisenhower um, um, transit system. system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, and anything in closing that we haven't covered that uh, you want to uh, touch base on? No, you know what? I would encourage your listeners, uh, if they haven't read the book, first of all, to read the book, I think will change their perspective on, uh, I think, a lot of what they thought they know about how police conduct business and how offenders think. Uh, whether you're from Canada or whether you're from Ontario or whether you're from London, there are stories there that have universal resonance and applicability. I would also suggest, uh, and this, I'm not being self-serving here, I've initial reviews, advanced reviews of Murder in Plain English, I mean, some experienced true crime readers have said it's among the most chilling books they've ever read and, in fact, quite disturbing. And there's a reason for that, and it's not because, again, I lay on the lurid details. It's because... Uh, there are things in there people really need to understand in the digital age about what they're seeing and reading online and what other people are doing and the potential dangers um, and sort of uh, portents that those serve as. And beyond that, after they've read one or both of those, they really need to go to murderdata.org and look up cities that they've been to, look up their own communities, look up cases uh, that they know about and do their best. We are crowds, so there's only so many detectives in the world. There's only so many Dennis Alsops. Uh, we are really crowdsourcing new investigative uh, techniques here where people who live in these communities can sort of do the heavy lifting for us and actually help identify uh, serial offenders, not by name necessarily, but at least by clusters of victims. And um, we're working on, a, working on a mobile app now. Uh, it's not very mobile friendly, but if they go to a desktop uh, I mean, I think they'll find themselves very quickly immersed in it, and we can use their help. Well, I, I strongly agree with all of that. Thank you, uh, Michael. I, I want to close with a series of questions. They're, they're, I'll hesitate to say fun after the last hour we've spent, but it's a way to kind of shake things off, get to know you a little better, called the lightning round of questions. Um, what book are you currently reading? Oh, Several. Uh, right now, The Angel of Darkness by Caleb Carr, which is uh, yes. the sequel to um, The Alienist, which is among one of the best standards of crime fiction of the last, I would say, you know, 30 years. Uh, that's my sort of um, you know, fun book, if you will, quote unquote. Uh, I've got textbooks and journal articles on the go at any given time. Excellent. Um, what's the first rock concert you ever saw? I saw Men Without Hats with Nash the Slash <laughs> opening when I was, I think, nine years old. That is classic. Uh, yeah. And then I think the first one I actually went to and was excited to go to and had the full experience would have been uh, the Metallica Black Album Tour in 1992. Oh, these, are, these, are, these are surprises and, and fantastic. Uh, what was your favorite cartoon show as a kid? You know what? Probably G.I. Joe, <laughs> that, that, that classic 80s, uh, you know, and they, they had oh, the well. uh, public service announcements to go along with them, and yeah. knowing's half the battle. See, it was uh, just a, a classic era for kids' television. See, that was the little tiny G.I. Joe, though, Michael. I mean, I grew up with the 12-inch G.I. Joe, and he didn't have a TV show. He was something you played with. Yeah, he was your imagination, <laughs> that's right. Uh, what's your favorite TV show to binge watch? Uh, several, I would say, right now, Homeland, and likely, you know, I've been binge watching uh, a lot of old Forensic Files episodes, yes. and uh, that, and and probably Homeland and House of Cards, which it sort of is like a lot of 
what's going on on television now with these high concept shows I've found sort of jumped the shark as they say in the last uh, season but I'll tune in uh, next time nonetheless <laughs> sounds sounds good and then finally, uh, what's your favorite lunch spot in London, Ontario? And and you can't say Stanley Variety because well, it's not there anymore. Though. No, it's, it's <laughs> shut down now, and that's a good reference, uh, offhand reference to the book, mind you. Uh, I would say uh, lunch. Oh, you've really stumped me. Dim? I would say, you know what? There's a new spot called. The Wolf on Wortley in Old South, and I'm skeptical of uh, local startups, especially places with gimmicky names. But uh, <laughs> I was there uh, a, a while ago, and I'm not even sure if they're open for lunch. But if they, I, I'm, I'm going to look into it. And I was there for an early dinner, and if they're open for lunch, I will go back. It's a, I would say, one of the more unique culinary experiences I've had recently, and and, and good draft beer. So hey, sounds very good. Well, listen, uh, Mark, uh, Michael Artfield, uh, thank you so much for spending an hour with us and, and discussing all of this and your, all of your criminology expertise. It's much, much appreciated. My pleasure, John. I'll come back anytime. I'm a fan of the cast and uh, keep up the good work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the podcast for this week. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Michael Artfield. Um, uh, as usual, just some housekeeping things. There's the website, www.teresalor.com. I will post, um, if there's anything visually interesting uh, that we discussed today with Michael, I'll, I'll post some links up on the site. If you want to contact me for um, information, tips, suggestions, you can reach me at teresalor at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter. You can reach me at JusticeGuy. That's at J-U-S-T-U-S-G-U-Y. Also, there's a YouTube account, which I sometimes forget to say. If, if you go on YouTube and look up Who Killed Teresa, there's a channel there. There's um, a lot of um, news programs um, there, including the... Um, uh, uh, Poirier Enquête, that's the most recent uh, half-hour TV show on the Teresa Lohr case. And then if you need something in English, if you don't speak French, the the W5 um, investigative program, for, which was done in 2005, it's an hour-long broadcast. You can also find that there, as well as several other news reports. That's all I got for today. Um, Thank you for joining Who Killed Teresa and have yourself a really great afternoon.